throughout the streaming online. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll open your Bibles to the Gospel of John this morning, John chapter 8, verse 12. If you're using one of the black Bibles in the pew or the chair in front of you there, you'll find it on page 840. This is going to be our last week in John chapter 8. We've spent quite a bit of time here, and so you're probably familiar with where John chapter 8 is by this point, and you shouldn't need help in finding it. I thought about moving on to chapter 9 and moving forward, but I really felt we needed to to spend one more week here and kind of fly high above to to see the big picture of the chapter. Uh, We spent a lot of time diving into the various sections of the conversation that's going on. There's a a discourse here between Jesus and those who profess to believe, uh, those who are the religious leaders in the day. And this conversation is going on back and forth, and we've, we've jumped right into a lot of the smaller sections here and really pulled them apart to see what this discourse is. And that's important to do, uh, but remember that uh, this conversation that we're spending weeks on only took a matter of minutes. And when the Gospel of John was written, it was written to be read in one setting, just the way the other books of the Bible are written. The letters that are written were meant to be read in one setting, and yet we spend weeks pulling them apart which is important for us to do. Every word counts, every word matters, and we want to hang on each one and understand them. But there are times where we need to step back and take a larger picture and and look at the broad picture of what's going on. And so I think before moving into chapter 9, we need to step back and look at this conversation that Jesus is having here, this theological discord that uh, that is going on. Now, by way of background here and refreshing your memory, in John chapter 8, what is going on is is, uh, the Feast of the Tabernacles. Uh, Jesus has come into town. He came in midweek. It's a week-long celebration that remembers God's faithfulness to their ancestors, to the children of Israel, as they wandered throughout the wilderness for 40 years, and how God had provided for them in what they had need. Um, So, this this week-long feast, what would happen is that the people, the Jews would come from all over the world. They would come in and they would build little tabernacles or little uh, shelters, little dwelling places out of branches and leaves and, and other, uh, other things that you would find in the wilderness, and then they would spend the week living in those. It was to remember the temporary dwellings, the temporary housing that their ancestors had as they went throughout the wilderness. And then throughout the course of the week, there would be various celebrations of both water and light. Um, the, the, the key celebrations here centered around these two events because these are two of the major things that God provided during their wilderness wandering. The children of Israel came out, they were parched, they were thirsty, they had their livestock, there were nearly two million of them, and they were not able to find fresh water. They cried out, and God provided water from a rock, water that flowed forward in a a massive stream and quenched their thirst and satisfied them. As they wandered throughout the wilderness, they needed guidance, they needed direction, and so God provided that in a pillar of light through the night that would lead them on their direction or on, on their way in the direction that he would have them go. So these key celebrations centered around both water and light, remembering God's faithful provision to their ancestors. Now Jesus comes, and uh, in the middle of the week when he comes, he shows up and, and he explains that the water celebration is really about him, that he is the true giver of living water, uh, that it, he is the fulfillment of it, and beyond that, that he is the original giver of living water. So much so that if you start to sit and, and, and understand and ponder what he is saying here, Jesus is claiming to be the one who gave the living water to the children of Israel. He is the same God who provided water from the rock, and he is the real source of living water. From there, as the week comes to a a conclusion, which is where we're at, we're on the last day of the feast here, when this discord occurs, Jesus is now explaining that he is also the light of the world, the very source of light that will guide and direct and order Uh, our steps. He is the one that delivers from darkness.
from there, this discourse uh, with the religious leaders begins. He teaches and says that he is the light of the world, and then they interact with him. And it climaxes when Jesus tells those who are professing to believe in him that truth will set them free. Now, when somebody comes and tells you that the truth will set you free, the question that should come to your mind and should flow from your lips is, what is this truth? What is truth? Because if you really want to be set free, that would be your answer. If you really understand that you're held captive and somebody says, I have the answer and here it is, well, well, what is that? Because that's what I want. And Jesus is coming along and he's saying, the truth is going to set you free. And so the correct response is, what is truth? Because I want it. But that's not how the people responded in that day. They didn't respond by asking what is truth. The hearers that day began to defend their freedom. We don't need to be set free because we're already free. We're not slaves to anyone or anything. Of course, Jesus then unpacked that in fact they are slaves, slaves to sin. We've spent a good deal looking at the various parts of this discourse, and what I want to do again this morning is to step back and look at the bigger picture before moving on and address the question that they should have asked. What is truth? Because the words that Jesus spoke to the hearers that day are still being spoken to us this day. Jesus is saying, if you're my disciples, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So our question should be, what is truth? What is this truth that you speak about? And my prayer is that as we walk through Jesus' answer, this discord, we will see his answer. And by seeing it, we will receive and believe and embrace Well, I trust you found the text by now. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. This is a lengthy passage, but I want to read the entirety of it. So stand with me as we read John chapter 8, verses 12 through 59 at the end of the chapter. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, You are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. And Jesus answered, Even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I come from and where I am going, but you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet, if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law it is written, that the testimony of two people is true. I am one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, therefore, where is your father? And Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. So he said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself? Since he says, where I am going, you cannot come. He said to them, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you, you would die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So they said to him, Who are you? Jesus said to them, Just what I have been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge. But he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing of my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham. We have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, 
Everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in, in, the, in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. They said to him, We have not been born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God, and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. The Jews answered him, Are we not right to say that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, Now we know you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Father, we ask you to bless your word to us this morning. There is so much in this discourse that goes on. And as we read it, our minds run back to all that we have studied and worked through. And now as we look at it from a larger picture, Father, help us to see Jesus as the truth. Help us to understand it, what he is claiming, and to receive it. May your spirit go out and do what only your spirit can do which is to cause the blind to see, cause the deaf to hear, cause the dead to live. Take hearts of stone and give them hearts of flesh. I pray, Father, that you would do your miraculous work of salvation this morning through the preaching of your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. In recent weeks, uh, <clears throat> I found myself in need of a pickup truck. I had a truck, I had a plow truck that I used to clear my driveway, and it's not going to be available this year, so I need to get a new truck, or new to me. So I started shopping the used truck market, and when you go to buy a used vehicle, it can be a frustrating experience. There's always a risk that comes in buying a used vehicle. You can buy it, drive away, and a few hundred miles away, something breaks that nobody could foresee was going to happen. The, the vehicle's old, it's tired, it happens. But sometimes, and what makes it frustrating is when the person selling you the vehicle knew there were problems and didn't tell you. 
or they describe the vehicle in such a way that you think it's fantastic, and when you show up to look at the vehicle, you find it's really not the way you described it. Uh, you were a bit deceitful in your description of it. Most of us can accept the risk of purchasing a used vehicle. What we struggle with is the hidden risks that are of, of the known things, the things that have been kept secret, the defects that have been hidden. You can do amazing body work with paint, a little bit of paint and a little bit of putty and make something look really good that's really not that good. Some of those, are, uh, some of those hidden defects are hidden by nefarious salespersons. They want to make a sale. They know you're not going to purchase a vehicle that looks like this. They cover it up. Don't tell you about it so that you'll purchase the vehicle. Sometimes it's a, it's a devious mechanic who will know certain tricks that he can make an engine or make a vehicle run smooth so that you think that it's good, but it only lasts a few weeks before it comes apart. Little tricks that they know how to do that only make you ugly after you make the purchase. I once bought a truck this way. I bought a truck with low miles on it. And I was assured when I was purchasing it that the bed was in good, solid condition and that there were no lights on the dash. It would pass inspection without an issue. On the drive home in less than 20 miles, the check engine light came on. Wouldn't pass inspection. And the first piece of wood I threw in the back of the truck punched a hole right through the bottom of the bed. Needless to say, I was very frustrated with the lies that had been given to me by the person selling me the truck. Another term that is often used when describing a vehicle is mint. Mint condition, they'll say. The interior is in mint condition. Well, what I have learned is that mint condition means various things to various people. Mint condition should be one slight step below new. Maybe a minor scuff or a scratch here. But I've seen vehicles that are described as mint condition that I wouldn't climb into. And I'll climb into most anything. But I think to myself when I look at it, you say that's mint condition, but I have to bring that home to my wife. That's not mint condition. It doesn't smell like mint condition. I'm not climbing in there. What I find is that words that we use to describe have become very subjective. Listen to this. This is an ad that I came across while looking for pickup trucks this week. It says, nice GMC extended cab. Smooth, powerful, 6.6 .6 Duramax diesel motor with an Allison automatic transmission, only 165,000 miles. Nicely loaded interior with many options and a factory Bose stereo system. Memory seats with heat, tilt steering, power windows, and more. My Duramax diesel runs and drives perfect. The push button for the four-wheel drive doesn't always work and the check engine light flickers on and off. My truck runs and drives perfectly. <laughs> I, I laughed out loud when reading it, because clearly we have a different understanding of what perfectly means. See, perfectly means there are no flaws, there are no mistakes. So how you can drive, describe your vehicle as running and driving perfectly and then follow it up by flaws that it have, has means that it doesn't drive perfectly. Those statements are incongruent. They don't go together. They don't work. Because by definition, perfect means without fault or defect. <laughs> that kind of a statement, in reality, is not a true statement. That advertisement, in reality, is not a true advertisement. Now, he may step back and say, well, it may not be true to you, but it is true to me. And this is where we start to struggle with our language. The human language has gotten skewed. Our human thinking has gotten skewed. What is true has become subjective to the speaker and relative to the situation. The truck runs perfect in light of the fact that it's 16 years old. The truck runs perfect the way I like it to run the way I think perfect is. See, the perception of truth is something that has, has become very subjective. Now, this is also nothing new. It's been talked about for generations. It's been argued over for generations. Philosophers have spent their lives debating what is truth. 
but it seems to have come back to the forefront again. Over time, various theories and beliefs regarding truth have been developed. In fact, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy lists no less than six theories to answer the question of what is truth. The main argument, however, can be really quantified into two categories of what is truth. There is objective and subjective. Or you might say absolute and relative. Those are the the real two categories of where we have come down to to what is truth when we argue it. Now, a a philosopher is probably going to come along with all of his nuances and say that I'm oversimplifying it, and I may be for his complex thinking. But for my simplified thinking, I've narrowed it down to two points here. Objective and subjective. Objective truth says that something is true based upon the state of the object being spoken about. In other words, it's true based on the factual object that is there. Subjective truth says that something is true based on the perspective, feelings, or opinions of the person who is speaking. So what becomes true is what I feel like truth should be, rather than what the facts actually show. In fact, we we ignore the facts and embrace the emotion. If you ascribe to subjective truth, then the truck advertisement that I read is true. Because in the opinion of the owner, that truck runs perfect. Regardless of the objective fact that the four-wheel drive does not work right. Regardless of the fact that the check engine light comes on and off and signifies there's a problem with the motor. But if you ascribe to a subjective understanding of truth, then this is true to him. Therefore, when he says it runs perfectly, it must run perfectly according to his subjective truth. Now, if you're the buyer, you're not going to grab hold of his subjective truth and agree with it. You're suddenly going to want to look towards the objective. This skewed understanding of, of truth brings us to the courtroom, where the courtroom, when you get up to testify, makes you swear under oath that you promised to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And the reason they phrase it that way is because they want to cover any possible way that you could leave out truth or distort truth or twist truth. So you have to tell the whole truth or you have to tell the truth, but you not just parts of the truth, the whole truth. And not just the whole truth, you can't tell anything except what is true. The problem though still comes up with a subjective view of true. Well, I did tell you that what was true to me about those facts. And again, we still struggle with truth. Is truth absolute or is truth relative? Is it based on fixed reality or is it based on perceived reality? Is it is a fix a fixed reality? A fixed reality is based on external objective facts. These are a fixed state of facts. We know that they occur or will occur or, 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 or follow a certain order, and that's what objective truth is based on. Relative truth is based on how I perceive things. So if I step in front of a bus, I'm going to get hit by the bus as it moves by. That's objective. We understand it. It's traveling at 55 miles an hour. If I step in front of it, it's the end of me. See, we can say that we ascribe to relative truth and say, I believe what is true to me. What may be true to you may not be true to me. So if you think it's true that you step in front of a bus, you get killed and die, that may be true to you, but it may not be true to me. Now that just sounds like lunacy. See, we we may want to say that we hold on to uh, relative truth. Uh, This idea that you have to be true to yourself. You have to obey what is true to you. That's the kind of language that is used. We even distort it and say there are alternative facts. You have your facts, but I have alternative facts. You have your truth, and I have alternative truth. It helps me to decide. Our culture is no longer an objective culture when it comes to truth. We no no longer base things on a fixed reality. We have determined that you can be whatever you want to be. We've thrown out science. We've thrown out reason. We've thrown out facts. It's how we come to the gender confusion that we have in our culture. The facts and the science say 
You're born in this gender. God has said, I have made you male or female. We throw out the, the objective facts in our DNA and embrace a relative truth that says, you can be whatever you want to be. This is the way that we end up telling two different stories about the same thing because we do and speak about what is true to us. We see it all the time in the political realm. We see it all the time in the social realm. We reject absolute truth. R.C. Sproul noted, though, that, that uh, regardless of what we say about holding on to relative truth or holding on to objective truth, when the rubber meets the road, we all really embrace objective truth. The moment you pull up to an intersection and a red light, you embrace objective truth. You can say all along, it's subjective to me. And as you look to your left and you see the tractor trailer coming along at 65 miles an hour and he has a green light and you have a red light, if you really hold to subjective truth, if you really believe that everything is relative and what is true to you, you can just hit the gas and go on through because you say, hey, it's relative to me. I don't believe he's going to go all the way through that intersection and I really don't believe he's going to run me over and destroy me if I pull out. Of course, nobody is going to do that. Anyone who says they believe that all is relative and hold the subjective truth is still going to put their foot on the brake and sit at the traffic light because they know the reality is that tractor trailer is coming through and it will kill them. So there is a measure of objective truth that we hold on to regardless of what we say. The only time we begin to reject objective truth is when it becomes a threat to what we want. When it becomes a threat to our desires. Then we reject it. R.C. Sproul said this. He said, We only accept relativism when objective truth is a threat to us. The holiness of God is a threat to us. Why do we reject objective truth? Because objective truth says there is a God who is holy and righteous and just. He is the creator of all things and the sustainer of all things. And everything in creation points to him. But if there is a living God who is holy and just, then I am accountable to him, and I am not holy. Now we have a problem. And I either submit and surrender to him and to whatever it is that he deems fit, or I rebel against him. And so when I come face to face with the objective reality that there is a holy God, it is now an affront to me. And so... I turn to relativism, and I say, well, if you want to believe in a God like that, that's fine. He may be true to you, but I choose not to believe in God, and He is not true to me. What you believe about God does not determine whether God exists or not. So what is truth? That's the question. What is truth? Well, in a clinical sense, truth is that which corresponds with reality. Not our perceived reality, but reality as it is perceived by God. God is the creator. God is the sustainer of all things. God is the one who has set things in order and holds them together. Truth is that which corresponds with reality. Reality as it is perceived by God. This question about what is truth is not a new question. It's an old question. It's perhaps made most famous by Pontius Pilate. We find this account in the Gospel of John chapter 18 when Jesus is standing before Pilate. He's been accused by the Jews of leading a rebellion against Rome. And they bring him before Pilate, and Pilate asks him if he is the king of the Jews. That was an important question that he asked him, because if Jesus says, yes, I'm the king of the Jews, there is now insurrection. There is treason. And it would result in the death of Jesus, the justified death of Jesus because he is attacking Rome, because in Rome there is only one king, and that's Caesar. And if you're in the Roman Empire and you're claiming to be a king, then you're your claim is against that of Caesar, and you are claiming to be at war with him, and they would put him to death. So it's an important question that Pilate is asking him. Now let's listen to the Inquisition from John chapter 18, verse 33. It says, So Pilate 
answered, or so Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? And Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priest have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. And Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was, for this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. Now, we don't know the tone that Pilate used when he made the statement, when he asked the question. We often read it with a tone of sarcasm. What is truth? And we assume that that is how he said it. And it very well may be that that's how he said it, in a mocking, sarcastic tone. What is truth? But it's possible that he asked with a, uh, a tone of humility. What, what is truth? What is truth? Could be that he was asking with a tone of uncertainty. I, what, what is truth? I don't know. What is truth? We'll never know, at least not in this life because the emotions are not recorded in the words. What we do know is that he went back outside to the Jews and he declared that Jesus had no guilt. He found no fault in him. Essentially what he did is he went out and he declared that in fact Jesus is without sin. Prophetic declaration. And then what did he do? He had Jesus beaten and crucified. Jesus said that he came to bear witness to the truth. That's what he came for. And Pilate said, I find no guilt in him. He has come to bear witness to the truth. Previous to this, in John 14, he was speaking to his disciples who were asking him questions and he said in John 14, 6, because they wanted to know wherever you're going, we don't know how to get there. How do we get there? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said, I am the truth. So the question again is, what is truth? John 14, Jesus said, I am the truth. And when we come back to our text in John 8, we find this conversation, this theological discourse going on. And this theological discourse is written like a mountain. That's how John has, has penned it and put it in here. There are sure and solid foundations at the beginning in verse 12 and at the end in verse 58. And those, stand, those footings are there to support everything that's built on, on top of it. And when you get to the pinnacle, you find the climax of the story. the climactic peak that comes between verses 31 and 38. Now, we've already explored all of these, these different parts of the chapter, so what I want to do is to remember to take a big look and then descend the mountain. So we're going to start at the peak. We're going to start at the high point of this chapter, and then we're going to zigzag our way down the mountain, if you will, back towards the beginning of the chapter, towards the end of the chapter, and again to the beginning of the chapter until we finally get to the end, which becomes the beginning and the end where the foundation is. So let's start at the top. And the question is, what is truth? The answer to that question comes in verses 32 and 36. Truth is Jesus. Truth is Jesus. Just as he would later declare to his disciples in very clear speech in John 14, he does so here with veiled speech. But it should have been understood. Look at verse 32. In verse 32, Jesus says, the truth will set you free. Right? Verse 36, he says, so the Son sets you free. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Do you see what Jesus is doing here? He says, the truth will set you free. If you're my disciples, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. 
It is the Son who sets you free, and if He sets you free, you're free indeed. He is using the term truth and Son as synonyms, both as the advocate, the one who, lets you, who, who sets you free. In other words, Jesus is saying that truth and the Son are the same. He is the Son. He is the truth. Jesus himself is the truth, just as he declared to his disciples in John 14. I am the truth. To double down on the importance of this, in that second statement where he is saying, if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed, he starts that statement by saying, truly, Truly, in verse 36. Or, if you have the old King James, verily, verily, he says. Now, there is weight to that statement because it is repeated. Don't ever dismiss repetitive words in Scripture. Sometimes we find it where the word is said twice or even on occasion three times, like in Isaiah 6 where it says, holy, holy, holy. The words are not repeated because the author wasn't creative enough to come up with other words. They're repeated for emphasis. They're repeated because they convey a deeper understanding of things. There is a a heavier weight that comes on them. No words in Scripture are wasted. When, When someone is leading off with a statement by saying, truly, truly, it not only implies that they are saying that the following statement, what I'm about to say is true. They're doubling down saying it is really true. It is truly true. And when you say it is truly true in the in the culture and in this understanding, what he was really saying is. Not only is the statement true, but I have firsthand experience and authority that it is true. I have firsthand understanding that it's true, firsthand experience that it is true. In other words, Jesus is claiming the knowledge and the authority of how it is to set the captive free. Truly, truly, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know this to be true. I have knowledge of this. I have authority in this area that the Son sets you free, that the truth will set you free. Freedom comes through the truth. It comes through the Son. The claim by Jesus is to be the truth. Now that's a bold statement too, to claim to be the truth, because essentially what he is saying is that everything I say is truth. And this is contrasted throughout this chapter. I hope you noticed as we read through it how many times truth was contrasted with lies. And each time, Jesus is the claim of truth. And when he says, I am the truth, what he is saying is that everything that proceeds from my mouth is true. Now, you and I might stand up at some point over some event, some situation, and say, what I am telling you is the truth. I promise, I'm telling you the truth here. There's been an incident. There's been an accident. There's been some kind of an event. You're called upon to testify in court. And you say, what I am telling you is the truth. And you and I can do that about certain events. But none of us would stand up and say, everything that I have ever said and ever will say is absolute truth. I never have a falsehood come out of my lips. Because we know we can't. Many times we have intentionally lied. Other times we have unintentionally lied. Sometimes we have used truth in deceptive ways. Sometimes we have said this is true only to find out later it wasn't true. We genuinely believed we were speaking truth, but only to find out later that the facts weren't there to support it and our understanding of something changed. We can't say everything that comes out of my mouth is truth. But that's what Jesus was saying. I'm astonished by how many people want to embrace Jesus and say, I think he was a good man. I think he was a good teacher, a good philosopher, a good good prophet. but I don't believe he was God. Jesus is claiming that everything that comes out of his mouth is truth. Either he is what he claims or he is the worst of liars. He is either the living and eternal God that he is claiming to be, he is the truth, or he is the most deceitful of all. Because he is saying everything that comes from my lips is truth and I only speak truth. In fact, Later on in our study here in chapter 8, we find that Jesus contrasts his statement of truth by describing the devil as having a nature and character of lying. In other words, everything Jesus says is truth. That is his character and nature. The opposite of that is the devil, and everything that he says is a lie. 
he is described as the father of lies. When he speaks, he only speaks lies. He speaks out of his own nature, out of his own character. Now very often, we find that Satan uses truthful words and makes them into a lie. That's how he started in the Garden of Eden as a serpent when he spoke to Eve. He took truthful words that God had said and he manipulated them into a lie to deceive. That's how he dealt with our Lord in the wilderness when he tempted him in the 40 days when he wandered. He used Scripture, which is truth, but manipulated and twisted it in such a way that it became a lie because everything that comes out of the devil's mouth is a lie. This is the contrast that he is showing us at this pinnacle point. Jesus is truth. The devil is a lie. The truth is Jesus. Now we see the pinnacle and we understand the answer, immediate answer to the question, what is truth? It's Jesus. Now let's begin our descent here and see the supporting factors to this. What does truth say? Well, truth says that there is a penalty for sin. Look at verse 21. So he said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. Jesus is speaking of a spiritual death. This is the opposite of dying in righteousness. He says you're going to die in your sin. Now it's appointed for man once to die. All of us are going to die physically. The question is, do we die in our sin, or do we die in the righteousness of Christ? That's the question that is at hand. And Jesus is saying to them, you're going to die in your sin. That's the state that you're in. Your sin has killed you spiritually. And when your physical body dies, you will be dead. You will die in your sin and remain spiritually dead. Because of sin, you are a slave to that sin. And because of that sin, you cannot go where Jesus is going. That's what he's saying to him. You can't go where he's going. Why? Because Jesus is going to the Father who is holy. Jesus is holy and going to the Father. And the only way into the Father is through one who is holy. The consequence for sin is that we die physically while we are dead spiritually. And we will endure the consequences of our sin for all of eternity. We will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now remember, the Jews that Jesus was speaking to that day assumed that they were in the kingdom of God. They believed that they were in the kingdom of God. That they were going to inherit it. Many people in the church today believe they're in the kingdom of God. And Jesus is saying to them, just as He is saying to the church today, you will die in your sin. See, the truth says there is a penalty for sin. It's not just swept away. It's not just ignored. And we cannot escape this reality regardless of what we believe about it. Many want to believe that sin is not that bad. That they may do some wrong things, but they also do some good things. You can believe your own theology all that you want, but it doesn't change the objective reality that Jesus is the truth. And He says there is no way to the Father except through Him. That in your sin you cannot escape on your own. That no amount of good deeds are going to outweigh the bad. It doesn't matter what you believe about this reality. It doesn't change its objectivity. So regardless of what you think is going to happen at the pearly gates, the truth says because of your sin you cannot go in. Third, Truth says paternity matters. Look at verse 44. It says, You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Why will you die in your sin? Because you are... You, your spiritual genetics, your spiritual DNA, you are born in sin, you are born in lies. When Adam sinned, he plunged all of humanity into sin. And so we are born spiritually dead. Which is why we embrace lies. Because our Father is a liar. So we embrace lies. We lie about reality. We embrace lies about our desires. 
We embrace lies about our character. We embrace lies about God. We embrace lies about our destination. But our only hope is to be of truth. It is to be made a son. And the only way to be made a son is to be born again. A new birth. We have been born spiritually dead with a spiritually dead father who is the devil. Our only hope is to be born again with a new spiritual father, to be born of truth. That is how the truth will set you free. That is how the Son will set you free. Your only hope is to believe in Him and receive Him. John tells us this in the prologue of this book in John chapter 1, verses 11 to 13. He came to His own. This is speaking of Jesus. He came to His own and His own people did not receive Him. But... To all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This is new birth. This is what matters. New birth means a new father and a new nature. Jesus came and we reject Him. But, to those who receive Him, welcome Him, embrace Him, follow Him, hold on to Him, cling to Him, they're given the right to become children of God. There is a new birth that occurs. And with the new birth, you have a new father, a new nature. No longer are we born of sin and belonging to the father of lies. We are now born in holiness and belong to the father of truth. That's what it means to be born again. Paternity matters. Fourth, truth says it is pitch black. Look at verse 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. We will have the light of life. The darkness that is spoken about is a pitch black darkness. The world that we are born into is a world of sin that is dark and we are blind in the darkness. We think we can see, but we don't. It's amazing what tricks your mind will play on you, especially in low light. You start to see things that really aren't there, but you are convinced they are. This time of year, I like to go out into the woods, and I like to do a little bit of hunting, and often I will sit in my tree stand until dark, and then I come down, and by the time I'm walking out of the woods, it's really dark. And it's amazing how many deer I see or think I see as I'm walking out in the dark. And what has amazed me this year is almost without exception, every time I'm walking out of the woods, I see a deer in the exact same spot. And I always stop for a second before I realize, wait a minute here, (laughs) that's not a deer. That's that same milkweed that's been, been there all along. And every night that I come out, I see the milkweed there. And for whatever reason, it's got leaves on it that in the dark look like the ears of a deer. But my mind will take those leaves that look like the ears to it, which in the daytime they don't look anything like a deer. They look like a milkweed. But at night they look like the ears of a deer. And then my mind will in fact start to envision the body of the deer behind it. I have no idea what the body of the deer is made up because when I get there, there is only the milkweed standing up. There is nothing else around it. But in the darkness, my mind has me convinced that I see something that isn't there. That I see when I don't see. We live in a dark world filled with sin, and yet we imagine that we can see. I've been in a dark cave under the earth with no light whatsoever, and we shut our lights off, and it's so dark, it is pitch black. You can't see your hand in front of your face. But as you sit there long enough in the dark, your mind starts to tell you, I think my eyes are adjusting. I think I can see. I think I could find my way out of here. But one wrong step, in that darkness, and we're dead. But the mind tells me I can see things that I can't. This is what happens. We live in a dark world filled with sin, and yet we're convinced that we can see, that we're not blind. We can understand reality. But the reality is, We live in a dark world that is pitch black with sin, and we are blind in it. 
Consider the commentary that John gives in chapter 3 of his gospel here regarding Jesus' coming. He says, and this is the judgment, speaking of Jesus, and this is the judgment, the light, that's Jesus, has come into the world, and people loved darkness rather than light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Jesus is the light that has come into the darkness to expose evil. And we reject the light. And when we reject the light, we die in our sins. And why do we reject the light? Because we don't want it exposing the messiness of our sin. Nobody wants their mess exposed before the whole world. The reality is, I don't want my mess exposed before me let alone anybody else. And the light comes into the world and it exposes it. I would rather sit in darkness and say, I'm good. I'm better than most people think. I'm doing okay. But the light comes in and it reveals, no, you're, you're a mess. You're filthy. You're not clean. You're, you're not wearing wedding garments. You're not able to go into the kingdom of heaven. Filthy. You're an absolute mess. That's what light does. It exposes reality. In the darkness, I can imagine I'm anything I want to be. But when the light is turned on, we all know what I really am. Well, those who embrace evil don't want their deeds exposed by the light of the gospel and the light of Jesus. They love the evil that they do and they want to embrace it. The truth says... We are in darkness, and our only hope is to follow the light out of the darkness. Fifth point, truth says there is a path to life. Verse 12 and verse 51 both point this out. Now we're getting near the end here. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Truly, truly, here's that phrase again. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. There's a hope for us who are stuck in the darkness. When the light comes in and it pierces through and it exposes our wretched sinfulness, there is a hope because the light says there's a way out. Follow me and you'll live. Truly, truly, Jesus says, if we keep His Word, if we hang on to it, if we cling to Him, we will never see death. If we follow and if we obey. Or, as the hymn writer said, trust and obey, for there is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. The Jews that Jesus was speaking to assumed that they were going to enter the kingdom of God. And Jesus is declaring to them amidst their rejection that they are not going to enter. They cannot enter unless they follow Him. And later on, again, as he was speaking to his disciples, I want to repeat it again from John 14, 6. Jesus said to them, I am the way. Follow me. I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. No one comes to me, no one comes to the Father except through me. The only way to the Father, the only way into the kingdom is through Jesus. It is the only path to life. Now, these are bold statements that Jesus is making here in this discourse. How can he support these statements? How can he support the statements that, that say, I'm the only light that can save you because you're in darkness. You've got to follow me. You've got to obey me or, or you're going to die in your sins. You're, you're not going to go where I'm going because you're, you're, you're chained. You're enslaved to sin. I am the only one who is true or of your father the devil and I am truth. How is it that Jesus can say these things? What support do we have to know that what He is saying is true? Final point here and final statement. Truth says, I am. I am. Verse 12 and verse 58, at the beginning and the end of this discourse, we find that the the entire conversation is held up by these foundation points. Verse 12, I am the light of the world. And verse 58, truly, truly, again, truly, 
truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Not only is this a true statement, but Jesus is claiming to have first-hand knowledge of the holy. The hearers that day cannot stand by indifferent to what Jesus has just said. They can't stand there and say, well, I enjoyed his teaching, you know, and I, there were some good points and some good life lessons we can garner from that. They're faced with a decision that they have to make in that moment. Do they receive what he has said and embrace him and say, yes, he is the truth? Or do they reject him? Because when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, and when Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am, what he is claiming to be is God a very God. I am absolute truth. I am the eternal God. I am the God who has created all things. I am the God who gave water to your ancestors in the wilderness and light for them to walk through. I am the God who spoke and light came forth. I am the God who holds the universe together, the God who measures it by the span of my hand and holds the water in the hollow parts. I am the eternal God with no beginning and no end. That's what Jesus is saying. And as they hear it, they either have to embrace it and believe Him, and receive Him, and be born again into new life, or they reject it. But they cannot stand indifferent. And you cannot stand indifferent. You can't idly stand by and say, well, I'll just pull the good out of that. You either receive Him as what He says, that he is absolute truth, or you utterly reject him. Because Jesus is in claiming to be the embodiment of holiness. He is claiming to be what Isaiah recorded in Isaiah 45.5 when he said, I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. That's what Jesus is claiming. I am Jehovah, and there is no other God. Jesus can only support his claim to be truth if, in fact, he is the God he claims to be. It is the foundation for his testimony. The question that we now have is not so much what is truth, because truth is Jesus. The question that we have is what are we going to do with truth? What are we going to do with Jesus? Let me state this as we draw things to a close here. What you believe about Jesus does not change the objective facts, the truth about Him. He is the eternal God who He claims to be. Whether you believe it or not does not change that fact. But what it does do is it has a, an eternal effect on you. It has eternal consequences for you. It affects your eternal and even your temporal destiny. To reject Him is to remain outside of the kingdom. To reject Him is to die in sin and not be able to go where He is going. Not to be able to go to the Father, to enter the kingdom, to enter to heaven. To receive Him means to be born again, to be made a child of the Most High God, to be given the right to become a son of God to inherit the kingdom of God, to enter in and to go where He is going because He is the way, He is the truth, and He is the life. And through Him, we see the Father. To receive Him is to be born again. And my call to you and the call of John throughout His Gospel is that you would receive and believe, that you would be born again. My prayer is that you would come to the truth today. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word, and I thank you for Christ Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. He is our only hope. I pray, Father, that you would enable us to believe and to embrace and not to, not to hang on for a short period, but to hang on for all of eternity to Christ, to follow him and to hold on to him and obey him as our life depends on it. I pray, Father, that your spirit would move and do those miraculous things that bring about salvation. We pray you would do it today. In Jesus' name, amen.